This week's episode was brought to you by Mary and Jessica. It's with the support of listeners like you that we keep making the strangest show possible for your listening enjoyment. If you'd like to become one of our illustrious supporters, please visit www.patreon.com slash the whole rabbit, where your tiny donation of just $5 a month not only gets you access to our entire library of extended shows, you also get a 5x5 vinyl sticker of our cover art, along with access to our Discord server, where you can converse, game, and even stream with the hosts and other listeners. Subscribe now, and for a limited time, you'll also get a 3x3 holographic whole rabbit skeleton sticker designed by Mari Sama herself. Make sure to check out our live streams on YouTube every Friday night. If you're a member of our Discord server, you can join the fun and stream with us. Subscribe either on Patreon or YouTube to get access today. On this week's episode, we discuss the fabled language of the birds, exploring our feathered friends for their unique spiritual properties, alchemical wisdom, and role in mythology. We discuss seven macaw, ravens, crows, peafowls, pigeons, pelicans, the phoenix, swallows, sparrows, herons, flamingos, and if you stay for the extended show, we even discuss what they get up to at Crocodileopolis. Thank you, everybody, and enjoy the show. Definitely. Are we recording the intro? Yeah. Okay, do you want me to talk about how much I hate the Animorphs covers? <laughs> See, I thought if the actual books were as good as the covers, maybe I would have read them. But they're not. Yeah, no, I, I'm, well, I guess I wouldn't know because I never even tried. I couldn't imagine anything that makes me want to read or, or, or just pick up your product less than the, the images of these people's faces slowly stretching into a horse or a goddamn elephant, like the, their nose elongates. I'm looking at this one right now of a black girl in a purple shirt, and her face is just getting longer and stretching out and protruding more. And then eventually she sprouts some, like, little, uh, little brown, like, horns or some shit out of her out of her head you know it just typical animorph shit but then her arms they they, they grow crooked and, and and her elbows turn to the front as she becomes a horsewoman or just a horse <laughs> and i just that's disgusting that's disgusting get that shit out of here i read one of them and it was like about this emo-ish kid who was like all a loner and i think he turned into a bird and he was like yeah i just want to be a bird forever and i think he ended up becoming he was the one who stays an eagle well and yeah it was he uh, can't turn back or some shit it was funny my sister used to talk to me about these books all the time like there were still kids who read them when i was you know uh like in the fucking late 2000s when i was in elementary school and my sister would talk about it and she's like oh but it, but, it, but it's really cool because because if they if they can't remember what it's like to be a human they can't turn back into a human and i was like wow it's pretty dark but like <laughs> that just makes those covers even more disgusting to me i this yeah, is immoral <laughs> It's some tried, alien's fault, too. <laughs> I tried to read one of those books when I was a kid, and I did not finish it because I thought it was so bad. Profligacy. That happens very rarely. I usually try to give a book a chance right up until the very end, but I did not finish that. Just shitty books. We were all yeah, too busy we're... reading Goosebumps, probably. Goosebumps was exactly. way better, yeah. Hey, I, you know, I read a little bit of Goosebumps, but I just I couldn't get over the shitty names that everything seemed to have. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, we got this fucking, uh, purple slime monster from Camp, uh, Jelly Jam. And I was just like, yeah, okay, whatever. You know what book right. was totally awesome uh, as a kid? I had an obsession with Benicula. You guys ever read Benicula? Oh, yes. I, was... <laughs> I did. <laughs> he, like, that was one of my favorites. I thought that was hilarious. Yeah, he, like, have... drains all it was the... Like... <laughs> he drains all the moisture from the vegetables in the fridge. It was like badass Peter Rabbit. It was yeah. like if Peter Rabbit was a goth emo kid. Okay, yeah. come to think of awesome. it, it's not... Well, I guess it's a little associated with animals, but my favorite when I was a kid was Narnia. I fucking oh. love the Chronicles of Narnia. It's so awesome. You like Mr. Tubness, don't you? Mr. I always did think Mr. Tubness was cool, but didn't didn't he sell her out? Yeah, he betrayed, yeah. but he, did, okay. he didn't want to. He felt forced to because the witch would kill him. I would die before I sold one of y'all out. I, I know, right? Me too. Fuck you, but... Mr. Tumnus. Aslan is my favorite Christ allegory. He's the Me only too. Christ I like. I guess normal Jesus is cool, but he's not as cool as Aslan. I want to hug Aslan's face so much. It's so think... big. 
He's just fucking noble. And then I he know. comes back from the grave, and instead of going, all right, I'll 2,000 years, suffer on Earth, bitches, he comes back and he bites her fucking neck and shakes her throat out of her body. Yeah. That's the way the real Jesus would do it. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Whole Rabbit, where we don't just tell you what to think about familiars and what they have to do with pets and animals. Nay, we tell you the occult anatomy of every single animal that Moses ever cared for and why their ethically sourced body parts might have a home on your altar despite your friends and family thinking otherwise because this week we're flying headfirst into the proverbial window that separates us from the birds as we safari through the mythology of spirit animals familiars and maybe even totems to be fair we're mostly just talking about burbs i'm your host Luke Madrid, the Hacking Rabbit. I'm joined this week by co-hosts, the Quixotic Canine, Mari Sama. Hello. Darth Dingus, the Blister Maker. Cover blisters. Melacore 5, the sinful, sinful shinobi. I guess I should just stay quiet like a ninja here. Sneak, sneak. And Heka Astra, the Shadow Pope of the Shiba Party think tanks. I don't even really know what that means. <laughs> The That's sinful funny. shinobi and the shadow pope sound like a fucking child molestation dream team. What is the Shiba party think tank? Collective of Shiba intelligence. What's their agenda? Well, you can't know that. It's private. Food. That's everybody's agenda. <laughs> that's 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 what animals are all about, man. Food and sometimes fucking, but mostly food. Yeah. My Shiba just stares at me and it looks like he just goes want, 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 want. All right, Usually so look, I, I guess I co-opted the Animorphs part to the uh, the very intro part, but uh, aren't birds fucking disgusting? I uh, yeah, they're gross. They're very gross. I, I mean, they like they shit everywhere. They're vectors for disease, but I don't know. I still think they're really cool. They're one of the cooler animals. They're really Apparently, the remnants pit. of dinosaurs. That's pretty dope, but that just doesn't mean anything to me when all I know is regular birds. I mean, it's cool enough. It's like saying, uh, yeah, my dad, my great, 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 great grandfather, he was Genghis Khan. I think like more than half of the world can say that, though. Yeah, yeah I think exactly. that's true for everybody. That's... Just like birds. <laughs> Fucking phony ass. It, mocking, mocking birds make fun of other things' noises. You know, it's even more disgusting than birds when birds are sick. That's even worse. <laughs> Like I, oh! yeah, I ran like a bird rescue for a while and it was like a whole lot of pigeons and pigeons are like, they're pretty dirty as it is, but like when they're sick, it's, it's so much worse. You know what else is fucked up about pigeons? They can be extremely aggressive. They suffer from jealousy and mating. If the pigeon's pigeon bitch runs off and do birds even fuck? I don't know. Uh, yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. Uh, they have cloacas. No. They, well, yeah, they, so if, they do if, a cloacal kiss. Ugh. <laughs> oh, nice. So look, if uh, if the male finds out about that, or I, I guess there's nothing to stop, whatever, one of them will tear the scalp off the other. This well, has been witnessed on multiple occasions. Pigeons mate for life. They'll mate with one partner, and they only will look or go for another mate if there's a death of one of the partners. That's the yeah. most disgusting thing about them. That doesn't stop other pigeons <laughs> from trying to, to to be like, hey, what's up, lady? Oh, yeah, like ducks? Okay, I think they, we only say they mate for life because we want to think that we mate for life. No, they legit they legit mate for life, and they can live yeah, a long but if time, they go like around, 15 years. If they go around, like, trying to cheat on other pigeons, you know, like, that's just... Other pigeons that are single will come up to the lady pigeon that's in a relationship, and they'll be like, sup, girl? And then the, the male pigeon that's with the, the lady will be like, hey, fuck off. Ducks are pretty weird, too. Some of the females have adapted to, like, close their, like, pregnancy, you know, tube down there. They, they have, like, a flap. Yeah, they and so like... that the semen doesn't impregnate them so that they can control the population. Ducks are the most prolific rapists in the animal kingdom, man. Yeah. yeah. It's crazy. They don't and... have cloacas. They have corpses screw penises the whole reason they evolved that way is because they're like crazy rapists and the female ducks evolved to have like these maze like vaginas so that's why they had to evolve to have these corkscrew penises to figure out the maze like vaginas that they had to get because they're rapists holy no, shit after the mating season the the dick withers and falls off and they can they grow a new one of varying sizes between the years yeah what? yeah yeah you could hypothetically not even hypothetically you literally could 
just be walking out near a pond and then find like this little like withered piece of beef jerky looking shit and it would be a cock. I hate to tell you, but there is a meme for this. So people who have ducks and chickens, I've only had chickens, I haven't had ducks, but I, I know people who have had ducks and chickens and because chickens have cloacas and ducks have penises and they're rapists, uh, if a duck rapes a chicken, which can happen, it, it can actually kill the chicken because a chicken just has a cloaca and can't deal with the corkscrew penis. It's fucked up. Yeah. Holy shit. I don't even really know why we're talking about this. Because the <laughs> claim is that birds are disgusting. Because it's, because yeah, it's in the birds. nose. <laughs> we're going to see how we're going to spend a lot of time talking about birds. And I just wanted to share my personal bias that I thought they were gross. I didn't really know that my co-hosts felt so similarly. No, I actually love, I mean, they're very pretty at least. Mockingbirds are fucking badass. I've seen them chase off like, hawks and falcons and shit because they've evolved to like guard certain plots of land and so they've kind of co-evolved alongside humans yeah, small. so so they can benefit off of our gardens and shit you know so they, they don't want other animals scavenging in their territory so they can chase off extremely large birds apparently according to my parents the first time i saw a bird in a cage like a parrot or a macaw I laughed continuously for 30 minutes. No, I do yeah. like parrots. They are kind of cool, though. Everybody likes parrots. Speaking of macaws. Seven macaws, a Mayan bird found in the Popol Vu, a text containing the mythologies of the Ka'iche people, a specific tribe of the Maya. The Quiche people. Mm. Seven macaws, a bird who magnifies himself. That's his other title, he who magnifies himself. Before the first dawn, he decorates his teeth with turquoise, places gleaming metals around his eyes, and his nest is made of a similar metal, which casts light around his tree. Though he believes that the light from his nest and from his face are capable of lighting the entire world. Therefore, he tries to impersonate the moon and sun to become an object of worship for the wood people. Twin heroes of the wood people, Hanapu and Jablanka, are journeying through the underworld to avenge their father's death when they happen upon Seven Macaw, whose arrogance and self-magnification inspired the twins to slay him by shooting him in the jaw with their blowguns while he's sitting down for a meal. The dart pierced his precious jaw, shattering one of his bejeweled eyes, sending him plummeting from the tree where he was eating the meal. In the ensuing scuffle, he bit off Hanapu's arm and then ran off like a monster in Monster Hunter. Do they actually take your arms? I just want somebody to take my flesh off so I can finally come. <laughs> You should go down to, you know, find the seven macaw, man. <laughs> now, the divine twins, unhanded as they were, devised a brilliant plan. They would pay an old man to impersonate their grandfather, who was supposed to be good at fixing magical bird jaws and resetting magical bejeweled bird eyes, because after arriving at the home of seven macaw, he was naively brought in to help. While rendering service, the old man replaced his dope facial piercings with corn and made seven macaw so unshiny and depressed that he never tried to imitate the sun and moon again. Seven Macaw, in fact, dies of shame shortly after. His two sons, Sipakna, which means alligator, and Earthquake, are similarly boastful and self-important. So I find this story interesting, first off, uh, because just thinking about the macaw, it's, it's a, one of those bright, colorful uh, South American birds that you'll see in either blue and yellow or blue, red, and green with the long feathers and that, uh, that kind of like dramatic, that large rounded beak that comes off at two sharp points. And they're known for their extremely raucous and loud calls and squawks. They're a bit like a uh, gay crow. <laughs> that's, no, what? that's a shitty joke. I, I was gonna say a f***ity crow, but I can't say that. Uh, <laughs> that a flamboyant that, crow. That's, that's a flamboyant awesome. flamboyant crow. Uh, a, a fucking whatever. I can't say the fun words for my own kind anymore. They're much bigger mm. than crows, though. The calls are huge. We associate like a crow's call or a similar animal with kind of like an unpleasantness. Oh, yeah. So like, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. as I you know, there's a too. dead body around, right? Yeah. Yeah, that. And then the fact that they just sound like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, fuck that shit. I think uh, one of, of my names. One of my neighbors used to have one, and we'd just be like, who the fuck is screaming? And they're like, oh, it's that guy's bird. And we're like, oh, yeah. <laughs> I love if seven, crows. If Seven Macaw was humble and had any good sense in him, he would know that corn is a, a good thing. 
I mean, I hate the flavor of it, but he'd be a hero of the people for feeding the people. I'm you know, native to corn. Shine like the sun. Yeah. <laughs> we know. Oh, boy. Personally, it reminded me of the Egyptian Lord of the Air, Shu, because Shu is the one that separates the heavenly and terrestrial Geb and Newt. Likewise, the realm of the airs, as we talked about in our demon episode, has a lot to do with the realm of the mind. It's also the realm of the ego. So his title of the self-magnifier makes sense because the ego has a tendency to deify itself. I think it's possible the ego is symbolized here by the birds or the macaw, and they're the same creature who occupies this midworld of the airs between the realm of the gods in heaven and the terrestrial. Then if you go over to the Kabbalistic tree of life, if you include Da'at, the tree contains seven central sephira, which pertain to the mental faculties of the soul, which also include the ego. Da'at is said to be the entrance to the abyss, and its guardian dweller Koranzon is described as a prolific self-magnifier. The name of the dweller in the abyss is Koranzon, but he is not really an individual. The abyss is empty of being. It is filled with all possible forms, each equally inane, each therefore evil, in the only true sense of the word, that is meaningless but malignant, insofar as it craves to become real. I want to be a real boy, Papa. These forms swirl senselessly into the haphazard heaps like dust devils, and, and each such spurgation asserts itself to be an individual and shrieks, I am I, though aware all the time that its elements have no true bonds so that the slightest disturbance dissipates the delusion just as a horseman, a meeting a dust devil, brings it into the showers of the sand at the earth. C.F. Russell, one of Crowley's disciples, went on, found the Karanzon Club, later renamed the CBG. CBG. Why would I want to be in the Karanzon Club? Isn't that supposed to be a bad thing? He's probably just saying it to be edgy. Yeah. Well, all magicians are edge lords. I'll take a stab at it. If they truly believe that the dissolution of the ego leads to the undiluted vision of the Godhead, then they would be using Korans on to dissolve their ego, supposedly. Mm. Along that line of thought, Seven Macaw's children, Alligator and Earthquake, both sound like the destructive and swallowing capacities of the subconscious, which have grown monstrous in the shadows, while the false ego remains magnified as the center of focus. So if you have seven macaw inside of you, this tendency to self-magnify and to like draw worship towards yourself, you'll have aspects of your subconscious that act as alligators and earthquakes. Well, you trouble cool. and disturb people around you, and you might harm people just to improve your own standing in yourself. You do things to maintain the illusion that you're worthy of the praise that you give yourself. Like a cult leader or somebody like Hitler is, is like they got a false sense of like what their actual role is. It could fuck up a lot of people around them. Mao Zedong's face will forever be associated with the death of millions of Chinese by famine, at least outside of China. I don't know what they've done to rehabilitate his image replaced it with the new great leader yeah but anyways the point is that was an expression and a consequence of his massive ego something like an earthquake anyway the macaw is a reminder that the articulate are not always wise and the wise are not always articulate that the ego is groundless <laughs> and seven macaw might be the mayan version of how the buddhists describe the mind as a chattering ape and i think both animals are good to symbolize the ego maybe he sees seven macaw because anybody can talk shit macaws they imitate their calls are often confusing so if you had seven of them calling at the same time and mimicking you it would almost uh be like being in like a hall of mirrors where you can't tell what's real what's you thinking or some somebody else's influence and it's like when multiple people are trying to talk to you at the same time and that's yeah. like, having an argument and that's like what i guess failing to cross the abyss is and you're like choosing a mirror to live in yeah because you like <laughs> it, you almost like the audience of it because it's really your own thoughts maybe being mirrored back in your head again either either that or you're just feeling some sort of comfort with it that... it's an echo chamber <laughs> so if we're discussing yeah. the kabbalistic tree of life if you were to go through each of the spheres kether is associated with the yakida which is like the spirit realm and then hakma is associated with the kia bina is associated with the neshima and then we'll skip the ruauk because it has that whole six spheres within it properly seven if you include da'af which is where koranzon is and then you have down at the bottom in isaiah you have malkuth so you have one realm that contains at the very least 
six spheres entirely to itself. The sphere of air just has a lot going on in the same way Mari was saying like, yeah, what would it be like if like seven different macaw were squawking at you? I, I, you could see it the same way Kabbalistically. Karanzon isn't necessarily a being or, you know, an individual, but when I think of it under this circumstance, I think of it as like the sum total of every living being that is outside of the clear light or the, uh, you know, the, the nuclear creative force that's calling out you can you can hear the sound of all these beings as you leave the world and it's everything you knew the cacophony yeah it's a it's very difficult force to contend with or to fight against or to balance it can show you everything you ever wanted. And but it almost sounds like static, though, unless you can focus in. Koranzon is the hermetic Satan, basically. The best way I understand this is in Buddhist and Taoist terms, but if you're trying to merge with the clear light, your adversary would be holding on to the world. Mm -hmm. So when Buddha was underneath the Bodhi tree and he attained nirvana, he went to stand up because he had the intent of telling the world. And as he stood up, Mara presented himself to Buddha and said, What? What are you going to tell them? And Buddha had to stop and think and said, well, if just one person gets it, it'll be worth me doing this. I believe that's a similar analogy to Karanzan. Mara... Hindu goddess of death. That would be like the lord of death who turns the wheel in the bardo. So anyways, animals and birds. My favorite bird to talk about is probably the crow and the raven, which is why it's our next subject in terms of bird. And arguably, they might be the most fascinating bird, and we can link them to a bunch of different mythologies. For a while, we used to think only apes like ourselves were capable of using tools consciously in a complex fashion. These birds, under various tests, were able to use sticks to push food out of inaccessible places. Archaeological findings indicate that such compound tools only arose late in the human cultural evolution, probably around 300,000 years ago, occurring in the middle of Paleolithic era, and might have co-evolved along with planning abilities, complex cognition, and language. Ravens have been observed attempting to trick potential onlookers by protecting tending to hide their food in one spot while secretly hiding it in another. This is also a behavior that's common amongst squirrels, I just thought I'd add. This behavior occurred in a location where the raven knew by experience could be monitored without detection. The studies conclude that the ravens are capable of comprehending the minds of others without direct recourse to observation, a trait we used to think was unique to ourselves and the higher apes. In one logic test, a raven had to reach a uh, hanging piece of food by pulling up a bit of the string, anchoring it with its talon and repeating until the food was in reach. Many ravens got the food on the first try, some within 30 seconds. And uh, it turns out ravens can also make very sophisticated non-vocal signals, which means as in gesturing to other crows to communicate. A study in Austria found that ravens often will point with their beaks to indicate an object to another bird, just like we do with our fingers. And even some dogs and wolves will do that too. Mm. They also hold up an object to get another bird's attention. That's why they probably like shiny things because it's easy <laughs> for them to see. This is the first time researchers actually have observed naturally occurring gestures in any animal other than primates. I mean, there are some, but those those examples maybe are trained, but we have a lot more to learn about. Even uh, ravens specifically, I'm not sure about crows. A uh, phylum, I guess, or family is corvid. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, they uh, some of them have the ability to actually mimic and speak mm -hmm. kind of like a mockingbird. But then they also uh, like ravens can actually mimic human speech and say hello. And I they can actually that. have conversations with you because they're almost as intelligent as a three year old. They're like parrots. The raven is larger than the crow and its neck fluff is a lot bigger. So I would imagine that, that the ravens have more flexibility with their speech patterns. True. Ravens, of course, are associated with Odin, who is, uh, as I said in the last episode, or, or one of them, Odin is Odin because he knows the secrets of the runes, or the word, speech, language. In 2012, this guy named John Marsluff uh, at the University of Washington, they were able to gather the data from their experiment that crows can recognize different human faces and associate yes. their expressions with positive and negative like emotions. Yeah, like they can hate someone and shit on their car if they know they're coming <laughs> by. They'll do that. I've heard that. And they also understand that the car is your vehicle and that the car isn't you, but they recognize your car. It's a tool. And because they know the human face comes out of the car every time that they, they see it. So if you stop every day and you give crows treats, they'll actually like fly down to your car every day. And, and then when you get out, they'll like crowd around you. Like they actually understand that the vehicle is not 
alive, which I'm I thought going, was really profound. I'm going to a patch of woods in the northeast with a bag of corn. And I'm going to train all of the crows in a three mile radius to respond to me throwing the corn so that when I am attacked or accosted by human or animal, they will feast upon their eyes. Oh, cool. But instead of talking in people speak, I'll make bird noises. Don't ask for one. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Nevermore. So our, our hunter-gatherer ancestors would have observed this keen intelligence of the ravens and the crows. And I thought it was really cool that ravens have a symbiotic relationship with wolves. Like the ravens will, you know, they're carrion birds uh, and they know that wolves will kill. So they'll actually like call to the wolves to signal to them that there is prey so that the wolves will come and kill whatever animal that is and then the ravens can pick at it. So they have a very symbiotic relationship. There are even anecdotes from modern deer stalkers that report that ravens will help them to locate deer in the same way. Like they they know that they'll receive the carcass. Once oh, that's once trippy. Yeah, do you yeah think, it's really cool. You think the deer know that? Do you think ravens could have vindictive feelings towards like specific animals and direct people People with guns to them? Well, I, I would think that the ravens would probably also recognize, like, if they helped a hunter before and that hunter didn't leave anything behind, like, if they just killed the deer and took the whole thing with them and didn't leave any of the guts or any of it, then they probably wouldn't yeah. help it, that same but, person in the future. But even still, I think it follows that if they can recognize a face, they can recognize a particular individual animal they don't like and attempt Absolutely. to take revenge. <laughs> yeah. Um. <There's, laughs> One the guy, should invoke the spirit of the crow to learn revenge. Uh, John Seton, I think his name is, the guy who founded the Boy Scouts and the Girl Scouts or whatever the hell. He was a hunter, and they hired him to go kill this wolf, I think in New Mexico. And his name was Lobo, and it was a alpha wolf and a, you know his companion, of all-white female wolf anyway this guy in, in his books he, he in his journals he would draw and write about how he would stand on this bridge and watch these crows migrate at this certain time of the year and he would shoot at them and he would wave his cane and he would observe their, their calls and that they would repeat it every time he would see that same flock and he did the same action on the bridge where they would cross over kind of trippy so they definitely recognize our tools they had a certain call for rifle they had a certain call for oh. cane they had a certain call for he's not armed he's just waving his arms and he even in his journals would write the like uh musical notation yeah and like so they have a language essentially they do, and they also have dialects. They have regional dialects. So the crows, like, around, let's say, like, where where I am right now in B.C., uh, the crows in Vancouver are probably going to have a different dialect than the crows in California. They have dialects just like people have regional dialects. I think that's really neat. Yeah, they definitely recognize our tools, for sure. So I'm just wor wondering if the deers and all the hunting game know that the crows are telling us humans where the fucking food is at. <laughs> yeah. If they don't know that, that's fucked up. <laughs> Survival of the fittest. Absolutely. Imagine imagine how fucked up it's going to be when crows grow thumbs. They're kind of there. I think if you gave them tiny soldering irons, we could teach them to make circuit boards. So in Welsh mythology, the god Bran the Blessed is a guardian of Britain whose totem is a raven. Bran ordered for his own head to be cut off, after which it could still speak words of prophecy. It's fucking badass. Legend has it that his head is buried beneath Tower Hill at the Tower of London. The presence of Raven at the tower is an echo of this legend. A prophecy says that if the Ravens ever leave the tower, Britain will fall. And the same source said that Ravens were kept at the tower with their wings clipped. That's some fucked up shit. Just to make sure that Britain doesn't fall. Just to make sure. Yeah, just, yeah. That's so the most magic. British shit in the world. Okay. I mean, if you're going to shoot a white stag in the street. <laughs> yeah. Like, it, it's very typical to what we know of their government. I mean, fair enough. Okay, so I also wanted to add here, not only in Welsh mythology, but there's a triune goddess in Celtic mythology, which uh, Celtic would be like when Ireland and Scotland and parts of Britain were all unified. The Saxons invaded, like, shortly after. So some of this stuff is also influenced by, like, uh, Nordic and, um, like, like Viking 
mythology. Morrigan, or also known as Morrigo, was a Celtic goddess of war, fate, and death. And she presided over rivers, lakes, and fresh water. She was the patroness of revenge, night, magic, prophecy, priestesses, and witches. She would always appear over battlefields. So whenever these people went to war, she would appear over the crowd incarnate in the animals like crows or vultures. Also, she's associated with all the carry-on birds, basically. And so however the birds would react would actually be like a divination tool that the people would use to determine who would win the battles. And so she was also known as a goddess of war. Basically, there are three, the maid, the mother, and the crone. So the crone was named Bad, meaning vulture or venomous. And then the goddess, the mother, probably Nimain, meaning frenzy or fury. And then Morrigan was, I think, the other one. She was the queen of demons or something that would actually clean up the battlefield. She would. She was in charge of cleaning up all of the bodies and stuff. Oh, because so all the carrion why, birds. Carrion. Yeah, so that's why she's associated with uh, the raven specifically is because she would be said to appear as the ravens cawing over the battlefield. And that's what, when Hecka told, told us that uh, you know, they actually have a specific call for wolves and predators. I thought that was very, very compelling to that story. So this is this is actually like a, a really or used to be a really, um, uh, I guess, popular form of divination was uh, augury. This is especially crow augury. That's the divination by observing uh, what the birds are doing, um, whether it's, you know, in their calls, where they are in relation to the person that is observing them and stuff. I used to do this a lot with crows. That was like my main form of divination for a long time was paying attention to the crows, what they were saying, where they were, uh, what time of day it is. The problem is finding where they hang out because they go, they scatter all over the place. Mm -hmm. Unless you form a relationship with one, it's very hard to observe them in the wild, but it is a gift when you see, you know. Well, the, the, mm -hmm. The birds that talk to me the most are the are crows, unless I'm like out foraging. And when I'm out foraging, I pay a lot of attention to the bird calls because <clears throat> there's this kind of hierarchy in the birds' calls. So like the smaller the bird that you hear, if it's more of like an alert, they're, so they're reporting that there's a larger predator oh, or yeah. there's a bigger threat. So the larger Bro. the bird and the more the alert the call, then the bigger the predator is. Like, there's a bunch of different calls. It's kind of hard to just sum it up. But like, if you well, learn what the well, calls are and stuff, you can. I was yeah, because it's like, okay, we we have squirrels in our yard, and when the crows start calling and getting tussled up, they the the rodents go into hiding because crows actually, when there's a falcon or an eagle or any kind of bird of prey mm -hmm. flying around, crows actually will t will gang up on it and attack it until it leaves. Yeah. For a long time, I've wondered about whether or not birds in general across species have some kind of social structure to them or, or a, a way of going about things like a, like a culture. Because most birds get up around the same time and start making calls around them. Once one bird starts calling at like five in the morning, the rest of them will yeah. inevitably follow. Yeah, they're social. And they're they, social they beings all go like down us. to the ground and pick up bugs at the same time and all go back up. They communicate about uh, weather. They rely conditions. on each other. If you want to learn how to understand what the birds are saying, I suggest like spend a lot more time in nature and just like sit there and observe them because like you can go out foraging. Like the last time that I went out foraging, I was listening to the calls of a couple of robins. The way that they were calling wasn't it wasn't mating. It wasn't alerting to any predators. It was them telling each other, like, look over here, look over here. So I followed them and they led me to some wild blueberries like huckleberries and stuff so like you can definitely interpret what the birds are saying if you like actually take the time to listen and figure well, out what it is something i wonder about is whether or not birds have a uh, a sense of justice and wrongdoing or like whether or not something is generally regarded as like a, a crime and whatever you could call bird common law <laughs> like uh, if there's a bird that frequently attacks other birds egg stealer are they, are they shunned you how do they do they start like do groups of birds start looking for one bird to attack because they're a piece of shit? I mean, like, <laughs> well, I think once the like if this? if they have a threat in their territory, once the threat has left the territory, they no longer give a shit. Yeah, but then there's also like no doubt there's a shitload of bird faux pas. 
you know? Well, you don't go to somebody else's nest. Or regardless you're of how complicated bird. or not their uh, their culture is, the fact that they they just they talk about information at that level kind of implies that there would be some chaos caused by it. Yeah, in L.A., like sometimes I'm on my balcony and I play a lot of my acoustic, uh, you know, just pretty much on the street. And the crows will line up on the power lines and I'm on the second story or whatever. And so they're pretty much at eye level with me. And I swear sometimes that like I wake up in the morning, I get ready for work and I'm going on my bike and like I get to work and there's fucking crows on the power line. And I'm like, I, I'm pretty sure that's you, dude. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I mean, and, uh, you can't prove it. You can't prove it's not the same group of crows because they go a lot. They go fly around a lot in the daytime. Yeah. And I don't know if you guys saw the video I posted on the Sacred Grove a few weeks ago, maybe now. But they were all just like circling around above the college near my store. And I was just like, oh, man, that's so awesome. It was like it looked like 100 or so. Man, I want they... crow friends so bad. That's like the number one thing I want as a familiar as a crow. You got to touch more to dead things, up. Mari. I you might have to give uh, up your left uh, eye. <laughs> I just better than your right hand. I like it so much. Hecka was teaching me that in nature, if you have a white crow, mama crow will usually peck it to death because that's considered like a strange thing. All well, the crows well, will no, peck no, no, it no. to death. All well, the crows it'll, will. Well, it'll attract. Um, it'll attract an uh, uh, you know predator. Yeah. And it will show off where they live because they have to raise the chick in the nest. So it's like having like like a big old sign that says free egg dinner or free little chicks to eat. Come on and get them. Well, like all, that's literally what it's saying. It's something that like doesn't typically occur that often in nature. Um, so this is like I don't know if you guys are familiar with this, but one of the, the Pope tried to release a couple of doves. And like oh, as soon as yeah. he, yeah, as soon as he released the <laughs> doves, they were just taken down immediately by crows. Like, they were just oh, immediately ah. and taken down. So, oh, this, no. is, <laughs> this is something that happens quite often in nature, where if you... Because there's no camouflage. You're just a big beacon for predators, right? So, a lot of times, the natural thing for an animal to do, if they have, if they have uh, an offspring if they have offspring that is not camouflaged or funny colored or albino they'll just kill it off because it's not a viable it's not a viable energy might, they they're yeah. wasting energy it's, on it to it's really it. weird how hard they target <laughs> white things oh yeah well, i mean when your entire fucking world is like blue green and brown oh i bet it hurts their eyes maybe like a bull in red I don't know. Well, they're definitely not going to feed it because it's kind of a waste of energy, right? You don't want to. Yeah, feed it's, yeah. That's just it's gonna not go camouflage. Yeah. As it being a being any kind of animal, like camouflage has kind of become ubiquitous. Forest animals are brown. Uh, animals that live in the snow are white. It, it's just always beneficial to look the same as your environment. It's just, it's basic. Luke just ran away. I don't know where he went. He's probably camouflaged. Bye, Felicia. <laughs> Did you see the fucking exclamation point pop up over his head? So, like, sometimes knowing how to understand what birds are saying, doing augury, crow augury, or other forms of augury, sometimes that used to be referred to as, like, knowing the language of the birds. And the other thing that was called the language of the birds was actually the language of the alchemist, which is also a kind of a cool bird connection because they used to use a lot of bird and other animal symbology to talk. But the, the way that they would write it was a lot of the times in, in a kind of cipher that would appear like gibberish. So people just kind of called it the language of the birds. I'm working <laughs> on a rabbit cipher. Don't forget the language of the flowers. That's how Victorian people talked about fucking. <laughs> oh, boy. So, uh, so yeah, they use they use birds in in alchemy a lot to symbolize different things. And the birds of alchemy, they mostly symbolize certain stages of the alchemical process. In many cultures, we were talking about this earlier. Um, birds are symbolic of mediating between the physical and the spiritual worlds. Uh, one obvious point is that birds are related to the domain of air, like stated before. So. The alchemical symbolism in the flight of birds recognizes birds as a metaphor for the soul undergoing spiritual development and aspiring to fly free of the restraints of the earthbound body in search of divinity. Um, so these birds that are used in alchemy reflect the inner experiences of our soul's alchemy during these endeavors. 
While several versions of the sequence of birds used for the alchemical imagery do exist, the usual sequence of birds to alchemical stages is as follows. It's black crow, which is a stage of blackening, the white swan, a stage of whitening, the peacock, a rapid iridescence of colors, the pelican, a circular distillation stage, and the phoenix, which is a final sublimation stage. There's there's obviously others uh, mm. that they use sometimes, like sometimes you'll see doves and eagles and stuff, but this is like a pretty common set. You see this language in the tarot as well when they're referring to alchemy. For instance, the empress is the white swan and the emperor is the phoenix. So the, the crow or the raven, it indicates the beginning stages of black or negredo, which is calcination or putrefaction. So this stage is an encounter with his inner self, the alchemist's inner self, and entering into what is the dark inner world of the soul. So the negredo is often shown as a death process. The black crow symbolizes stepping into our inner consciousness from the physical senses and the restrictions that bind us. Notice there's a black crow on the cauldron in the art card of the Thoth Tarot, and it symbolizes this exact thing. Yes. And the uh, white swan in the stages of alchemy is a separation or purification. One begins to experience the inner world filled with light. This initial inner brightness is often mistaken for their true illumination. The white swan is simply the first conscious encounter with the etheric world. When compared with our physical sense experiences, this stage can be overwhelming to the experiencer and interpreted as a bright white light. The swan is a bird in which is more commonly seen gracefully swimming rather than flying. Hence, this is an apt choice for a symbolic representation of the this alchemical stage. It moves along the water gracefully, and so in terms of the soul, on the soul's surface. And I think it's kind of like the Holy Guardian Angel, maybe? The like, vision of the Holy Guardian Angel? It sounds a little bit like the Sophia experience I had. Yeah, like like first contact with the Holy Guardian Angel on the tree. Like Perokeith, which sounds like a bird. Perokeith, I mean. So the, the next stage is the peacock stage, and this is a stage of fermentation. It represents the experience of the astral world appearing as like a fluid shifting pattern of colors. Woo! This experience is often symbolized in alchemy by the peacock's tail specifically because of its splendid iridescence. So a, here a turning point is reached and the alchemist becomes truly conscious of the etheric forces and the astral body. So the peacock represents an astral body consciousness, an inward immersion and an outward expression. And the tail is the inner transformation which arises from a true conscious experience of the astral body. The peacock's tail stage was sometimes split into two facets. So one being an initial winged dragon phase, which resolved into the peacock's tail. So the negative, distorted aspects of one's being can end up dominating in the initial encounter with the astral body, and that's symbolized by the winged dragon. But through purification of the soul, the beauty and splendor of the astral body are revealed in the peacock's tail. I kind of would rather just be a winged dragon. That's such, that's a little cooler. It gets yeah, better, though. Gets Dragons. Better. Look, if I'm a winged dragon, dragon in the alchemic long dragon sense you know what that means do you know what that means Big i can pee -pee? eat my own ass i was close can't, can't give up the, the best thing in life you might not even awesome. have an ass right. you might have a cloaca you could eat your own cloaca pretty sure peacocks have cloacas That's so gross <laughs> <laughs> Is peacocks are long enough if ravens aren't my favorite bird, then peacocks definitely are. I love both of these birds a lot. Hey, look, I'll I abandon the subject. I'm just, I'm just saying. I think a peacock's neck is long enough, but you know, dragons and snakes and shit, like long dragons, uh, they're kind of like just neck. <laughs> <laughs> so the next stage in alchemy is the pelican stage. The pelican is symbolic of distillation and the red phase of alchemy. This phase is an act of working with the soul forces, symbolized by the pelican stabbing its breast. We talked about that before. Uh, so it's a sacrificial stage of the inner being for the alchemist, where you nourish yourself with your developing spiritual embryo within you. Uh, so one's idea here. of oneself here must be changed and transmuted and sacrificed to the developing spiritual self. This is like typically a very painful experience, which tests your inner resources. 
eventually from this will emerge the spiritual self transformed through the pelican experience. So the pelican in a spiritual sense of sacrifice can be related to kind of a personal internal Christ experience of the alchemist. And we saw the pelican symbolism used in the ritual of the phoenix, which is why you cut yourself and you're supposed to soak up a little bit of the blood on the cake of light, one of which is burned, one of which is consumed. That's nasty. That's my blood. I don't mind. Yeah, okay, that's that's different. Which leads us to the Phoenix. The final Phoenix stage completes the process of soul development. It is the stage of coagulation and the creation of the Philosopher's Stone. The Phoenix bird built its nest, which also serves as its funeral pyre. It then sets its nest alight, cremating itself from the ashes that rises anew and transformed. This is the alchemical experience of spiritualization. The alchemist has completely integrated their being and is no longer dependent upon the physical body as a foundation of their being. The alchemical phoenix stands upon the sureness of the spiritual, having attained the philosopher's stone, the spiritual core of its true being. The dying of the senses of the black crow stage is ultimately transformed into the triumph over the death process of the physical, embodied in the symbolism of the phoenix. I guess it's not even saying that this is like a red fire. This fire could be like a bunch of different colors. This this <laughs> is fucking crazy to me because it... Uh, okay, so one of the first intense occult experiences that I had was when uh, during the pandemic, I became bored and started reading old alchemy manuals and manuscripts. And there's this thing described in most of them where... Essentially, if you've done alchemy in a past life and you start to research it again, if you did it right, the concepts come flooding back to you very quickly. And it's like I could understand what was uh, what was being discussed in the book to the point that I could talk about people, talk about it with people that were actively studying it. But uh, I've just been having this kind of, uh, I don't know, th this theory on the path of spirit can take through existence where over time instead of having traits attached to your ego you can begin to just embody them in your being certain behaviors patterns things that you identify with yourself can just become part of you without you having to think about who you are yeah inversely it's like spiritual luggage that people might be carrying from a past life you wow I've, I've heard of both of those things and experienced like what Dingus is talking about, and I've heard bad experiences of what you just mentioned, Malachor, where I met a girl once at a rave. She was like, I was having such a bad time in my life until I met the psychic who told me that I was a Templar in my past life, and I took a vow to exterminate all evil upon the face of the earth. And so I had a very bad time until I relinquished that vow in my life now. But also, I've had a psychic tell me that I used to be a Tibetan monk, and that's why I'm obsessed with sun mandalas. She had no idea that that's all I did all day was draw oh. geometric circles and essentially sun mandalas. And I had them up all over my wall. And and that's that's like where I got started in magic was looking at geometric shapes. And then I tended very quickly. Oh, my gosh. Towards me mandalas. Too. Holy so, shit. Me, too. I collect mandalas and craft them, too. Essentially, what I'm talking about here is, uh, well, I hear voices in my head, but sometimes they tell me things that come true. Sure. Actually, fairly frequently. One of the first ones that I kind of heard on repeat when I, I basically started on my current spiritual path was you are covered in ash and then Negrito, which is the the, spirit, the alchemical state of... Uh, I crow. Negrito is the black useless shit left behind after you burn something through calcination. Yes, the ash. And but it it's was even more concentrated ash. It's associated with, uh, at least in my context, the weight of a past life. Uh, but well, you're, it can you're be supposed removed. to burn it off, right? You're supposed to burn it down to that point. Uh, yeah. Well, the thing is with Negrito, it's already been burnt off and it can be cast away. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So certain cultures have daily purification rituals. In Shintoism, I forget, it's on the tip of my tongue, but it's just been so long since I've regularly read about anything regarding Shintoism. But it's a ritual where they find uh, a waterfall and they uh they sit under this waterfall or they really like squat it's a masogi yeah and, and they were they they have this specific chant they recite to rid themselves of the uh pollution or in the japanese sense it's a concept called kegare which means impurity akuma has an attack a super badass attack in uh street fighter it's called masogi it's when he comes he teleports up from the sky with like a lightning elbow 
<laughs> you know, it chops people in half or like meteorites in half and shit when he does it. It's kind of cool. It's called Masogi. It's kind of dope. Yeah. It's purification. Yeah, it's a uh, ritualistic. Yeah, it's exactly what Dingus just said. Done daily, even in the winter. It's fucking brutal. It's worse than a cold shower, I imagine. Yeah. Okay. I'm done. <laughs> if you'd like to hear us talk about birds in ancient Egypt, birds of prey, the ibis, food animals that you might eat, reptiles including the snake, the Ouroboros, and hungry, hungry hippos, please visit www.patreon.com slash the whole rabbit where your donation of five bucks keeps us making these episodes every week, but you'll get stickers, access to our Discord server, and a few other perks that I can't remember because I have had too much chai tea. Uh, thank you, everybody. Bye. Wait. We can't. Wait. Wait. Watch our live streams, please, God. It helps with the <laughs> algorithm and like the video. And if you buy the, the the fucking Patreon shit, you'll get to hear the second half of the episode where I'm wild and crazy because I poured one shot of rum and some lemonade, carrots and shoes. <laughs>